Welcome back to the Love and Dubai show. We are now joined by one of England's biggest fitness influencers, if I can call you that. I'll forgive you. Thank you. Uh, YouTuber, two-time number one Sunday Times best-selling author, host of his own podcast show. Welcome to the show, James Smith. Thank you for having me. And welcome to Dubai. Yes, very nice. Very nice to be back. Uh, you've been here for two weeks before you jet off to the States. How is your time? Are you yeah, meeting good. the locals, making friends? Yeah, and I'm quite excited to have a time. For the first time in a while. You beat me. Yeah, just about. <laughs> I've got Irish skin similar probably to yourself. We got, got a little bit of red to go brown. We do. And have you been working out here since you got like outside? How are you finding the weather? Uh, it was really hot the first week I got here. And everyone was saying, oh, it's a bit too hot. I was like, it's cold in the UK. But then I got here, I was like, oh, it's a bit hot. Yeah. Um, I've been training jiu-jitsu while I've been here. So oh, cool. yeah, I've been very welcomed by one of the local team at Champs, but a bit demoralized at the same time because they're a very good team. I'm sure that's just being humble. Um, let's jump into who you are and let our audience get to know you a little bit better. Um, one of the headlines that jumped out at me about you is you have been called the Gordon Ramsay of the fitness industry. Why is that? Uh, How do you feel about that too? Yeah, it's, I'm flattered to be, you know, compared to someone who's so successful in their field. I think it's very flattering. I think that we're both very direct to the point, no BS, we swear a lot. And then the fact I'm probably blonde Uh, I'm very shouty, can be a contributing factor <laughs> All I'm thinking well. right now is like, idiot sandwich. Are you like that to yeah. people? Yeah, <laughs> John, I haven't actually seen too much of Gordon Ramsay's stuff, but then when I have dipped into it and seen it, I was like, okay, I get it. Okay. Because it's not what I'm like all the time. It's social media and similar to probably what Gordon's done. You've got to keep people entertained at the same time as delivering some content they find valuable. Uh, if I had a passion for cooking, I probably would have seen more of his stuff. Uh-huh. But uh, yeah, I think that you're in that space. We need to deliver valuable content but at the same time. Some people do need to get told off. Interesting. Talking about your approach, have you always been, I guess, you said you were there confident, direct, like going back to when you were a kid, has that always been your personality type? Um, Probably more rebellious when I was younger than anything else. I've not ever really been in a position to be authoritative with anyone. Mm. So I worked in a corporate job up until my mid-twenties where I was at the bottom of the food chain having to, you know, work on computers and send emails so I never had the opportunity to do it but I think from a responsiveness standpoint rugby coaches for instance when I was growing up I responded much better to the ones that were honest they would say to me you know what you're being dropped because you played rubbish at the weekend can't believe you played that badly with your parents watching get better or you won't get selected again and it hurt but then the next training session I'm there I'm there on time I'm not pissing around whereas if someone wraps you up too much and says oh you know we're doing a play rotation we're just playing it Like, that's not going to motivate me to do or elicit the change that's needed. So I think my approach is very much I give what I would like to get. Mm. Well, the interesting because that's quite personal to you. But I just wonder now when people are sometimes a little bit more sheltered and the, the feedback that they get, um, how do you think your approach differs to the fitness industry overall? Do you think people are mollycoddled and that's why some people resonate with what you do? Yeah, and I think that even if you were to say 10% of people responded to my approach, that still leaves me with millions, tens That's of true. millions Billions of people. Billions, maybe. I don't even know. And then if 90% of people are a bit butthurt from my approach, I'm like, cool, go to the abundance of boring personal trainers that are going to, you know, make sure your feelings are never hurt. Because you know, it's, <laughs> it's true that the majority of personal trainers are like, you know, they're, they're not willing to say anything on social media or to their clients. that might have any negative consequences. And with such an abundance and saturated market of that, if someone's like, oh, I find your fence where you swear too much, I'm like, go to the other coaches then. Mm. Because I find the people, I almost try and see my approach like a sieve. I rattle out all the bad clients. The people that end up using me as a personal trainer, they're awesome, they're fun, they get it. Whereas I found that training on the gym floor, people that wanted a discount, people that paid you late, people that complained, I would sack them straight away because there's so many, I know the term at the moment is Karens or people that are just there outraged by social justice. They make awful clients. You wouldn't want to work with them. So Getting sacked by your PT. Do you know what? It's one of the most liberating things. Anyone listening that works in any profession where they're in a position to do it, often 20% of your headaches uh, or 20% of your clients will give you 100% of your headaches. So you can sack. 20% of your clientele and eradicate 100% of headaches. Interesting. So imagine saying something, you're going to earn 20% less money, but you're going to have a 100% better time at work. I'm thinking about my day right now. Who could, who could go? <laughs> um, but you weren't always in the fitness industry. You mentioned there you were in corporate um, and you had the 8 a.m. to 6.30 job. Um, I guess, I don't know, wearing a suit maybe, Starbucks in the morning. What was it worth paying? How much a day for PTs? 
So yeah, I mean, when I started off, uh, I worked in IT sales, and it's not really sales, you're just calling people, trying to hustle something. Then I worked in recruitment, I did have to wear a suit and tie, I had to be clean shaven as well. So you'll never see me clean shaven. This is me being rebellious. Rebellious, like, middle finger to the, to yeah, the corporate world. Two days, I'd have like a two day stubble and they'd be like, you need to shave that. I was like, I'm not even client facing. I'm literally sat in an office with all of my peers. I'm getting told off having a bit of stumble comfort. I think a lot of people can resonate with that. I'm not client facing, so why do I have to follow these ideals? Yeah, and, and I'm a very warm bodied person. I live in shorts all the year round, even in winter. So like having to wear a suit in the middle of summer in London, yeah, not the one. So how did you make the jump? Um, I found that there was almost like a little re- release valve that was happening every year where I'd work a year in corporate and then bang, I'd go to New Zealand to play rugby for six months. And I'd do a year in corporate, then bang, I went to Asia for six months. And like, I think that I was doing this extreme of doing too much work and then doing too much holiday. And when I became a PT, I was like, oh, if I do a job I enjoy, I might not need these big releases every six months to go travel. So I ended up doing a job I actually enjoy. And I thought, if I charge three people 30 pounds an hour a day, I can live off 90 quid. Ah, like, that's I, it, okay. <laughs> I, could, I could legitimately live off that. And I was like, wow, imagine only working three hours a day and being happy. I was like, this sounds all right. And getting into that kind of mindset and approach into personal training, I loved it. And that made me want to work harder. And it was amazing to be in a, a machine where the more effort I put into it, the more money I could make. The more effort I put into it, the better trainer I could be. Whereas so many other jobs, you get paid a finite amount of money and you've just not got to get fired. And yeah. you learn the same amount. So then people are on this spectrum where they turn up and barely do the work and they get paid the same as if they you know, excel every day. And it was, I found that quite a motivating factor. And, Yeah, I've been PTing since uh, about 2014. PTing, becoming a best-selling author, becoming how I described you as one of the biggest fitness influencers. <laughs> um, you started obviously making content. When was your content first recognized? Like when was like, a vi- let's like forget the word influencer for now, but like when was a video that you created actually resonating with an audience? You're like, wow, I can actually really make an impact online as well as in person. So if I was to say it's been eight years, Uh, someone asked me the other day, how long did it take you to get to 10,000 followers? And I said, four years. So from year one to year four, 10,000 followers. From year four to today, I think it's 870,000 on Insta and Facebook and, and whatever. So nearly a million, not bad. Nearly a million, but that, that <laughs> first four years, I never became focused on, on like how big or how much traction or how many views. I was like, okay, I'm going to become focus orientated. I'm going to post at least once a day. I'm going to look at my DMs whenever I can. I'm going to try and keep a, a, a finger on the pulse of the market to see what people need help with. And then it's been this huge exponential uprising. I wish there was a viral post, but to me, it just it's about turning up every day and just playing the game. It sounds I've gamified a lot of my work, so it's very surreal for me to actually look at the, the numeric What numbers. do you mean you've gamified your work? So to me, everything seems like a top score. So I never for once sit down and go, oh, That's 80,000 people watching my story. That's Twickenham watching my story. I don't think. I'm like, oh, yeah, 80, that's, that. that's higher than 75, top score. <laughs> and then when the following goes up by 1,000, I just see it as a top score. Okay. So then I never think that's 1,000 more people that are now invested in my content. I, I removed myself from that because that's a very overwhelming ordeal. So then when I create content and I do stuff online, I think about how it's going to benefit the score. So then, yeah, it, I've removed myself from everything, so it doesn't feel real. We should work on our top scores in Love and Two Ali. Yeah. Um, speaking of the people, when was, talk to us about, like, let's say, personal success stories or what, um, the people that you've worked with, maybe a, a story that has stuck with you over time. Um, I mean, there's been quite a few kind of success stories. What I do every three months up until the pandemic was uh, we run 12 week challenges, and whoever won, I would take on holiday. But it wouldn't be like oh. whoever lost the most fat or whoever built the most muscle. They'd have to contribute like a story of like maybe hardship or issues they'd had. So then I could say, okay, fair enough. This person lost more weight than you, but this is a single mom who's a nurse of two kids and she's lost eight kilograms and transformed her life. And, you know, so then I would take them to the Sydney or to Fiji or like one time an Irish lady called Layla. She lost a tremendous amount of weight. I took her and her husband to Fiji wow. and, she, and she couldn't swim. So I said to her, I'm going to teach you to swim from home Fiji. So when you I did that- You took them to Fiji? Yeah, it was pretty cool. That's amazing. So yeah, we, we did some crazy stuff like that. And then we're taking groups of people to Bali. And because um, I train jiu-jitsu, I get them all to do at least one session at Bali MMA. So I've got these people that are coming from all corners of the earth that have never trained before. And like to get a picture of them all in sweaty geese trying out something, uh, yeah, it's 
been a lot of fun. When you say from all over the world, is that because they're online uh, people that you work with or they just happen to be from all over the world? Yeah, so uh, as of four years ago, I made the jump to go online completely. So I ran rather than, if I PC someone face to face, I can only help that person for an hour. And when I was training the first few years, I realized that all these conversations I'm having are being repeated. And when I show someone to squat, I was like, hold on, why don't I record all of this and make this accessible to people for 10% of the price? Because unless you can afford quite a lot of money per week in personal training, you, you're not going to get the help. So I was like, who's going to cater for all of the people that can't yet afford personal training? So I created an academy. I hired some of my coaches from the gym so that if someone wanted to listen to all the conversations we'd ever had, they could access it for, we've got one um, kind of program that's like £15 a month where yeah. you couldn't even get half an hour with a PT for that. So then it also reduced the fact that I wouldn't have a geographically restricted business. So I've got clients in America, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, England, Ireland, and then even some that are out here in Dubai. So wherever anyone is, they can access me as a trainer, but not have to pay the premium of having the conversations repeated. How do you keep them engaged if they're abroad? Like, I love the idea of jumping on to, uh, let's say, for example, getting my workouts cheaper, um, but I would worry that I wouldn't continue because it's like, it's cheaper, great, but then what's actually keeping me coming back? So it's more so like a three month course. I like to uh, compare it to like getting a driving instructor. So you sit there, you're like, I don't know what I'm doing. There's a car here. I want to be able to have full control of it. I don't know. I've got anxiety. I need someone to help. So I sit in with them. Like this is a clutch. This is a brake. This we need to indicate. This we need to check. At first, it's terrifying. Over time, it gets easier and easier and easier. And you keep asking questions. Keep getting answers. There has to come a point though where you split from the driving instructor. Now I don't understand why the personal training model isn't seen like this. Because yeah, you can have someone by your side. Yeah, you can have a driving instructor there the whole time to hold your hand. But the liberating part of the journey is when you go on your own. You must remember the first time you drove when the driving instructor got out and you were on the road. on your own and then ever since there that's really where the growth begins when you take it on your own so my personal training approach is about giving people the tools that they can say goodbye to me because that even from a business standpoint business minded people are listening going well he's not going to earn that much money from it well if i help them for three months and i transform their understanding they're going to tell their friends and their friends are going to go what you haven't got a pt anymore they're like i don't need one they're like whoa what is this what's going on so i think that's a much more uh you know viable means for people because even if someone doesn't have the luxury of a few hundred pounds I say look three month investment do it and also if you know it's going to come to an end you're more likely to do the work and understand and learn things in that finite period it's a different approach but it's definitely one of strong values um one thing that you said before is you're passionate about exposing the toxic toxic myths within diet culture what are the myths or fads that you hate the most within the fitness industry what but- should we be avoiding For, for a start, there's a massive overcomplication of the fundamentals where I joke around with someone and say, if I came into your apartment and I saw your dog was really overweight, I wouldn't be like, we need to intermittent fast this dog. Don't feed him before 1 p.m. I wouldn't be like, oh, you... Intermittent fasting is so tempting, though, because it's like you give up that food for like 12 hours. And it's it's just, tempting. It's just eating less. And then you would say to the dog, right, that needs to go on more walks and eat less food. That's what you'd say. You wouldn't go... dog needs to do keto you wouldn't like oh that dog needs supplements very oh, true you, you put your dog on fat burners <laughs> so when it comes to all these myths and fads and everything everyone's looking for a solution that doesn't point to the fact that people need to consume a bit less and move a bit more what about body positivity and people are saying people should be positive in whatever body they're in is there such thing as being too positive yeah i mean uh, if we look at other very noble incredible Uh, you know movements of the last decade if we look at feminism fantastic cause we have a small population of people that are taking it too far if we look at veganism incredible cause from an ethical standpoint then we've got people hindering other people's businesses protesting not letting butchers do their job not letting farmers do their job and then again if we look at body positivity on the whole a fantastic and noble movement which you know i wear speedos when i'm around the pool i'm, I'm part of that movement but then we've got you know It's very apparent how many um, businesses are using this as a wave to jump on for like a virtue signal where, you know, it, there's no way of saying it. I know that health cannot just be, you know, uh, determined by someone's fat amount. There are so many other elements of health that sit outside how much we weigh or how much weight we have, how much excess weight we have. But we can't be taking obese people and then using them as, you know, a cover story for what is healthy. And we saw Cosmopolitan do this. 
And I felt sorry for the, the 12 people that were picked, some of them athletes that I admire, but some of them were being used in you know, a, a stunt to merely get engagement and comments and outrage. And I, don't, I can't imagine what that feels like for someone to be picked where you know, they are a plus size model or body positive or whatever you want to call it, but they must know deep down they're being used as part of a, a current trend to get to the top of algorithms. And mm. that I don't think is fair. And I think that if I was to put that in front of most people's parents, they go, what the bloody hell is that? You know the conversations happening in front rooms that would never go online. It's created a false echo chamber where people are so petrified of being you know, cancelled online that no one speaks up about it. So you put a picture of an obese person promoting even health foods. There are some companies in the UK promoting health foods, using obese people, saying this is healthy, but because the comment section will only be of people backing up the narrative, mm. people feel like, oh, maybe they go, oh, maybe this is the future. Maybe this is what the world's about. But people uh, believe what they want to see. Exactly. To. And if someone goes, you know, this isn't healthy, boom, you are the social justice warriors will come for you. And, you know, health at every size, you've got this, how dare you, fat phobic. You, you challenge the status quo in this, like, uh, narrative, you're fat phobic. You say that, you know, um, someone who's uh, born a male, you know, competes in a female sport, so you're transphobic. You know, you want to talk about anything to a race, you're racist. You want to, suddenly, there's a social justice rebuttal for any conversation that's being had. You're no longer allowed to be ignorant or wrong on a topic. Mm-hmm. So, you know, even if you were to say someone was to see someone clear, of <laughs> clearly obese. Comment sections right now, 100%. Yeah. And you say, hold on, I don't understand why there's an obese person preso- uh, pre- you know, being used as a front cover for health. You don't get educated, you get cancelled. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it's a very hostile place at the moment for people in these areas. Uh, you're not wrong. I could 100% agree with you. I have uh, two more questions before we have to say goodbye to The Number one is help us. We have a fitness expert here and we have our fitness issues, so maybe you can help us t- tackle our problems. Either A, you can tell us exactly what we're doing wrong, or B, maybe you can help us. So for example, me, um, like many people, I can be consistent to a point, go to the gym, three weeks maybe, solid, and then four weeks gone. Fall off the bowling running totally. How do I fix that? <laughs> so when we look at... Um type of ways that we can motivate people we have intrinsic motivation and extrinsic motivation now if you're extrinsically motivated you might be doing something to avoid something bad happening you might be doing it because you don't want to get overweight you don't want to have your clothes stop fitting you don't want to be shamed by someone that you know maybe like a family member or whatever these aren't good motivators Mm. so if you're doing something just to avoid something bad happening which a lot of overweight people do If you say to them, hey, you should exercise so you don't get type 2 diabetes, that hardly gets them jumping out of bed in the morning. If you can get something in line with an intrinsic motivator, so you find an exercise selection or modality that you find personally rewarding, you won't need to be motivated. So, you know, if you if you had to put your hand on heart and say, do I love going to the gym? Your answer might not be yes. And that would be indicative from your actions of not being consistent with it. So I might say to you, why not explore other avenues? Maybe start playing squash. Maybe... start doing boxing class maybe start doing something where when you wake up hungover you still want to go to it find something i love find a passion we can all we can all relate (laughs) yeah so i think for a lot of people where they they say oh you know i'm struggling with motivation i'm like you might be doing something that you don't particularly want to do it might be like forcing a triangle into a square gap could well be that uh james is in town for a very short amount of time uh you split your time tell me if i'm wrong between australia and the uk yeah um but as you guys know dubai is the city of fitness influencers it's like they have just congregated here it's like the ireland take over the world fitness influencers have taken over dubai they're everywhere uh thoughts on the fitness influencer scene here in dubai could you ever see yourself moving here um i wouldn't come here for a work standpoint i just come here to get more sun <laughs> and see my friends but what people should appreciate is a lot of people are in their position of influence through how they look, not who they are. So from a genetic standpoint, some people have a very easy time having a great physique and also some people have very different values to you. Now, you and I might value friends, family, going to nice restaurants and having a good brunch once a week. There are some people out there that only value how they look. They're hugely insecure. They have nothing going for them in life apart from this existential angst about how they look. So they're willing to be hungry, to eat the plain chicken and vegetables, and to look a certain way to portray themselves. It is their identity. Now, 
when 100 of us put a picture up on Instagram, those people that care about how much they look that much and don't have a life outside of it will go to the top of the algorithm. For a lot of these people, they are only in this position because of that. So the reason that people don't connect with them, the reason that people don't have this kind of relationship with these people is because they found their way to the top merely on their values and how they look. That doesn't mean they're qualified to help you. It doesn't mean they particularly care. You can tell how little they know about their clients' problems because they don't post solutions, they post workouts. Mm. Oh, hey guys, here's today's workout. No one cares. How are you helping someone with that? You know, it's, it's such a crazy world we live in that these people, even these influencers, the reason they're all here and most of them are skin. And, uh, you know, I, I know a couple that go to the UK. Imagine this, Dubai influencer, I won't name them. Please don't. <laughs> Went to my local barber and he's got a big following, got a haircut, fist bumped him and walked out without paying. And I was like, it's apparent that these guys don't really understand their market or their demographics because Ooh. their content is about them, how they look, some down lighting and some tanning oil. It's not about helping people. And that's why in probably 10 years time, they won't be doing what they're doing. Okay, so you're not a massive fan of the fitness industry, that is quite clear. However, um, a lot of wisdom and a lot of uh, gems that we can hopefully look back on and get some motivation to go out working out. Uh, thank you for your time. Cheers, Lisa. thank you very much. And if you come back for a holiday, you're more than welcome back in the studio. <laughs> Guys, that is it for us on the Love and Dubai show. We're back with you every single weekday morning, same time, same place. Stay safe.